The scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 28 through 35. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I apologize. I sensed uh, a growing panic among the red shirts because they, they, they were not quite ready for that moment yet, as well as the choir, who was like, are we singing now? Why are we doing so? What are we doing? <laughs> A lot of things happened today. I mean, I mean, if there's anything else you want to try to cram into a Sunday morning, now's the time to let us know so we can try to do that. We, there was a kids' choir at the 9 o'clock service. There were Bibles given away. We had, we had apple butter earlier. If you, if you didn't arrive in time to purchase a jar of apple butter, um, I, my suggestion, which comes directly from the apple butter team, is that you volunteer next year, because if there's more volunteers, there's more apple butter, and it lasts a bit longer. A um, lot of wonderful things, including that there's a, if you walked in the west entrance, you saw there's a tree in the west entrance, um, which is unusual. We're talking about a, a new worship series starting today called The Tree of Life. This is a scriptural image that appears um, primarily at the beginning and ending of the Bible. So we see a tree of life in the second Genesis creation story, Genesis 2. Uh, it's right there next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil at the center of the Garden of Eden. And we see another tree of life, uh, maybe the same tree of life, but the image of a tree of life is present in Revelation 22 as well. This time not in a garden, but in the city, the new Jerusalem which has descended from heaven and is now here. And this tree of life is on either side of the river that flows from the throne of God. And, and, and this, this tree is um, therefore kind of like a framework. It, it forms this, this frame for scripture. It forms this sort of rhythm of how we encounter the word of God. And so we're going to be talking about how the rhythms of our life together shape our own identities the seasonal patterns and rhythms of our life as a church, what we call our ordo, the rhythm of work and praise and Sabbath, the, the way that our individual identity as followers of Jesus is shaped by the life of our community. Even in the earliest church, these cycles of work and festival and rest were present, shaping and forming the people. And so we today, as the church, continue in these same patterns and these same rhythms, even generations later. It's how we know who we are. It's how we know our very identity. And so there's a tree uh, for this series for the next several weeks. And next to the tree is a table. And on that table, there are leaves and pieces of fruit. And there are two different things. And everyone is invited to sort of get the leaves and the pieces of fruit onto this tree. But before, uh, before we put the leaves on the tree, what we are inviting everyone to do is write something on the leaf. Now, the leaf is to represent what it means to you personally to be a part of the Manchester UMC community. What does it mean to you personally to be a part of the Manchester UMC community? In July, we had this We Are Manchester series that talked about who we are as a community. This is more like how do I resonate with that. What does it mean to me personally? That's your leaf. Write a word or a thought and put it in the bowl on the table. The fruit is uh, focused not on you but on the community. It is to articulate an impact that the work of this church is having in the community around us. 
the fruit of our ministry, a way that someone's life has been changed that you have seen or that you've been a part of or that you're giving witness to. Write that down on the pieces of fruit. Put them in that bowl and we'll put them on that tree as well as we create this tree of life together. I'm also happy to say that there are a two members of this congregation, two households that have uh, given some lead gifts to this tree of life season as a way to nourish the tree. Our, our giving, which Blackshire tried to rush us into, our giving nourishes that tree. The giving is what makes it possible for, for us to be a part of the community. It makes it possible for the impacts to be felt in the world around us. So all are encouraged to give during this month to nourish this tree of life as we connect together. Among the rhythms of our life together, one of the most essential one that's at the center of it is the rhythm of our worship. The rhythm of our worship together does shape us individually as it shapes us as a community. And we draw from scripture as a way to think about this rhythm and this pattern of worship. Specifically, one of the clearest places is in the story that we refer to as the walk to Emmaus. Now, Bill read the ending part of the walk to Emmaus story just a little bit ago, but it is a longer story that takes up a lot of Luke chapter 24. It is a post-resurrection story. And um, it forms the sort of order for worship. The basic pattern of a worship service, according to the United Methodist Book of Worship, has these four component parts. The gathering, proclamation, response and communion, and the sending forth. And this is true no matter what the style of the service is, no matter what the location of the service is, no matter how long the service is or short the service is, it should have these four component parts. A gathering, a proclamation, a response and communion, and then the sending forth. And you can see this in the Emmaus story. So at the beginning of the Emmaus story, in Luke chapter 24, there is a gathering. It is a gathering of just two of the disciples, but where two or three are gathered, there Christ is present. And sure enough, as these two disciples gather together after the crucifixion and are walking along this road, they are sharing with one another their grief and their pain and their ex confusion about the events that they have experienced. I mean, after all, they've seen their friend and rabbi crucified and they've heard stories about him being alive again, but they're very confused by all of this. And so they're sharing this together. And, and as they gather and share their life together, Christ, the risen Christ, shows up and walks alongside them. In a similar way, we gather as a church together. And when we do gather, we share our lives together. We talk about how was your week and how's the kids and how's the parents and what's been happening at work and all these kinds of things. We gather together and we share our lives together. And that happens in this space. It happens in the lobby. It happens online. If we gather online, we can share in the comments and connect that way as well. We gather together and connect with one another, sharing our burdens with one another and opening up a connection to the risen Christ with us. In the Emmaus story, there's then a moment of proclamation because as they are walking along, Jesus connects their experiences with the words of Scripture. He interprets the Scriptures for them. And in interpreting the Scriptures for them, he shows them how the things they have experienced connect to the Scriptures. That's the word of proclamation in our time of worship. We read the Scriptures and then hopefully we're able to make some connections. As a preacher, one of my primary objectives is to try to make connections for the words of Scripture to our real-life experiences, to give people something to take home with them. The best compliment a preacher can receive is, Preacher, you gave me something to think about this week. You gave me something to take home with me. You gave me something that I can apply to my life that is relevant to what I experience in the world. This word of proclamation is present in the Emmaus story as well, and we draw from that to shape our rhythm of worship. The Emmaus story comes to a point of response where the disciples are asked to make a decision. They're walking along the road and they arrive at Emmaus, having spoken with the risen Christ and he proclaims the scriptures to them. They now have a decision to make. He is going to go on. He is going to walk on down the road. They're going to stop at Emmaus and their decision is whether or not to invite him to stay. Whether or not to invite Christ into their lives and they make that decision. They make that response. They decide to invite Jesus in 
to their moment with them, which is a moment of communion. So they sit down at table, they break bread together, and it is in the breaking of that bread that Christ is recognized by these disciples. So we have this as well. We have ways to respond to the proclamation of the word. We have opportunities to respond, always four or five opportunities every week, decisions that we can make, uh, ways to live our lives and shape our lives that are in response to the word proclaimed, in response to God's invitation. We have a, a moment of offering in this particular order of worship. That moment of offering is another way to respond to God's proclamation in our lives as we give in response to what God has done for us. This moment of response is significant for a time of worship. Now that communion moment is something that happens in this service once a month and most of the time it's on the first Sunday of the month because apparently the first Sunday of the month was when John Wesley said all Methodists should ever take communion ever. No, just kidding. That's absolutely not what John Wesley said. But that's what we do. For some reason, uh, first Sunday of the month is Communion Sunday. So you know that the sacrament of communion will be celebrated on the first Sunday in this service. Manchester celebrates the sacrament of communion every single week, however. So if communion is something significant to your life, the Saturday afternoon worship service at 4 p.m. in the chapel is always, always has the sacrament of Holy Communion in it. But I would say to you that even if the the sacrament itself is not present in the worship, Methodists are pretty good at being sacramental in how we gather around the table, especially after a worship service. Many of you are already making plans. And if the sermon gets boring, you'll be thinking more about these later for what you're going to do for lunch and who you're going to connect with and who you're going to invite to sit at table with you and fellowship in response to this worship service. And so while it's not the sacrament, it is clearly a sacramental way of being together, gathering around the table. In addition to that, if you want to wait a couple days, come on Wednesday where we have our community dinner at which there's literally the opportunity to sit at table with siblings in Christ and connect in a moment of sacramental meal together. Last week, the, uh, the community meal on Wednesday had 200 people set a record for the community dinner. And kudos to Tiffany Conway and that entire volunteer team for making that happen in such a beautiful and effective way. There are always opportunities to convene after the time of worship for that moment of communion. But then there's the sending forth, right? So there's a moment at the, in the Emmaus story where they're done with the meal and this beautiful kind of mystical uh, moment when Jesus vanishes from their sight, which is fun to think about, especially the sound effect that must have had. Um, so he he's vanishes from their sight, and they're at the table. And, and here's the thing. They can't stay at the table. They don't stay at the table. They're sent forth. And those two disciples who have, who have gathered together, who have heard the word proclaimed, and who have been uh, given an opportunity to respond and celebrated communion, they now are sent forth. To do what? They're sent forth to witness to what they have seen. They are sent forth to tell others that they have indeed encountered the risen Christ. And they go back to Jerusalem and they give witness to their experience. They share their experience. They announce the good news that Christ is alive. And that is our sending forth as well. We don't stay at the table. We are sent forth into the world. There are so many mountaintop experiences in the Bible. Many stories about people on a mountain having this divine encounter. And the thing in common with all of those is that they don't last. You don't get to stay on the mountaintop. You're always sent into the world to announce the good news and serve one another as Christ serves us. It is a reminder, this sending forth, that we are the church. No matter where we go, no matter when it is, we're the church no matter what. This is the basic rhythm of worship, the basic pattern of worship. And like I said, you can see that it impacts every time of worship that we have together. In this space, in Fellowship Hall, in the chapel, wherever we gather for worship, these, this pattern shapes and forms us. And it comes directly from Scripture. I think of this worship time as the heartbeat of the congregation. It's the pulse of the congregation that gives energy to all we do. It connects us, and it connects us in so many ways. First and foremost, it connects us to what has come before. 
It connects us to the generations before us. In the United Methodist Book of Worship, we read that the basic pattern of worship goes back to worship as Jesus and his earliest disciples knew it. Services in the synagogue and Jewish family worship around the meal table. This is, by the way, a picture of worship in the sanctuary that is now the Fellowship Hall, taken in 1969, right? If you see yourself in that picture, you can raise your hand. Worship service in 1969. We are connected to the generations that came before us. When we worship together, it connects us to that past in a mystical and profound way. There are multiple references uh, in the book of Acts to early Christians who, who, who took part in, in synagogue worship services. The early Christians, the first Christians who were Jewish, continued to worship in those ancient Jewish patterns and practices. And then they added to those a celebration on the first day of the week, a celebration of resurrection. Resurrection is recorded in scripture as having happened on the first day of the week. And as a matter of fact, the phrase, the first day of the week, is the only detail about the resurrection that is in common in all four gospels. All four Gospels, when they talk about the resurrection, sometimes the details are a little bit different about who showed up and what exactly happened, but not the day of it. The first day of the week is when it happened. And so followers of Jesus gather for an additional time of worship on that first day of the week. And most of those meetings included a celebration of resurrection and also that Lord's Supper. So one of the things that our worship does is connect us to the generation's that came before us. And it connects us to what's going on right here and now in the present. This is our last year's confirmation class, right here and now in the present. Reverend Ruth Duck, who is considered an expert on worship across the church, says, worship is the work of the whole people of God. And one of the greatest ministries of worship is finding ways to help people participate in the moment with heart, mind, soul, and strength. That means making worship more accessible to all worshipers in diversity, calling forth praise and lament, nurturing their relationship with God and their ministry in the world. This is worship for the whole people of God. In fact, Ruth Duck's book title is Worship for the Whole People of God. Worship builds community in the present moment. Worship shapes the identity of the congregation in the present moment. I'm unconvinced that there's anything, there's such a thing as solitary religion. I'm skeptical uh, that there's such a thing as solitary religion. I know there's solitary encounters with the divine that we can have those personally, but, but I think it's so vitally important for us to do this together. In scripture, every time there's uh, an opportunity to encounter God, it is done together. Worship is what we do together. It's an action. You say, I'm going to worship. That's, that's a verb, that word worship. I am going to worship. It's like saying, I am going to sing. Or I'm going to hike. It's, it's, a, it's a verb. I am going to worship. It is something that we do. There's no such thing as a passive worshiper. There's no such thing as passive worship. And there, there are a lot of ways to be actively engaged in worship, to be sure. It can be up front in, in front of the room in a, in a kind of a leadership capacity, certainly. But it's also in our own verbal uh, participation, whether it be singing or saying something together, we participate verbally. We can read something together. But, but even beyond that, there is a way to be actively engaged in worship just sitting in the midst of the community in silence, just engaged in your own heart and mind, just present fully without the need for verbal expression, but so many other ways we can see and hear what's going on. We can move. I, it is, I give everyone permission to move in worship. I know we're Midwestern Protestants, so we don't like to do a lot of moving, but go for it, man. If you feel the Spirit, move your body, clap your hands. When we clap, for example, for, uh, for a moment of worship, we are not saying thank you uh, to the performance we have just b- been given. We are praising God that the group that just led us in worship did so, and giving thanks to God for that moment. We can move, we can express, we can connect 
to this present moment. And it's beyond just being in the room, too. What, one of the things we've learned in the past several years is the, the value of being connected through technology and being connected online. Back in uh, 2020, 47 years ago in 2020, we were, when we had to shift to online, one of the big questions was, are we going to record our worship services, paste them all together, and then then post them? Or are we going to do it live and be in the space while we're doing it? And ultimately, we decided to do it live. We decided to be in the space doing it so that that present moment could still be honored. So that even connecting online, you would be encountering something that was going on right then and right there in this space as we worship together. It is something that connects us together in the present moment. But more so than connecting us to past generations, more so than connecting us to the present moment, worship connects us to God. And that may seem self-evident, but it needs to be said. Worship is about God. End of story. Worship is about encountering God, about connecting with God. Worship is not about what's most convenient for me. Worship is not about how good the music is. It's really good, but... Worship is not about how comfortable the seat is or whether the AC happens to be working that day. Worship is not about whether there are enough donuts or apple butter for when you show up at church. Worship is not about how it makes you comfortable. Worship is about encountering God, the omnipotent creator of the cosmos. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, worship services can last up to three hours (laughs) okay as they work through their liturgy it can take them three hours and I haven't even gotten to the best part yet because in most Eastern Orthodox sanctuaries there are no seats because you stand in the presence of the divine accommodations are made for those for whom that's difficult but you stand when you're in the presence of the divine worship is about encountering a power that is so far beyond our understanding and comprehension marva dawn says we lose our reason for being if we do not constantly remember that god has called us to be god's people And our ability to even respond to that call in worship and in life is totally the gift of God's grace. I've heard it said that when we worship, we should all come wearing crash helmets and there should be seat belts in the pews. Something to that. Shouldn't make us super comfortable to be in the presence of the one who created everything and has this amazing, miraculous power. And here's the audacious thing we we not only we we do this on purpose like like we are we make a choice to enter into God's presence and sometimes we even invoke that presence in our midst are you kidding me invoking this awesome awesome power and I use the word awesome in the way it was originally used before all the kids started thinking everything was awesome right The awesome power of God is present with us and worship has to be about that. If it's not about that, it's not about anything. Worship isn't just something we do, therefore. Worship is something God is doing as well. God is not just the object of our worship. God is the subject of worship. God is at work and God is changing us during this encounter. You should leave a worship service different than you were when you arrived. The love of God changes us. The grace of God changes us. Being forgiven changes us. The power of the Holy Spirit changes who we are. We are changed when we gather together, when we connect with the power of God, when we respond with our lives and are sent forth into the world, we should be sent forth changed. We should be sent forth transformed. The rhythm of our worship It forms the identity of the congregation and as such it forms our individual identity as members of this congregation. We'll be talking about not just worship but how other rhythms and patterns of the church impact us and change us over these next few weeks. 
So sometime over the next few weeks, let's I hope everybody takes the opportunity to, to create this tree of life together, the tree of life that's over by our west entrance. Speaking of west, thank you to Jason West for putting that tree together, and it's a fantastic job. It, it, Jason West, by the way, and, and Dave Nagy and our whole, whole that, that team, you just tell them, I want a tree in the lobby. And they're like, okay. And they just, they make a tree just happen in the lobby. It's pretty cool. Well done. Nice job. So, it's fantastic. So take a minute. Check the tree out. Take, take one of those leaves. Ask yourself, what does it mean for me, personally, to be a part of Manchester UMC? Write that down. Put it in the bowl. What, and then take a piece of fruit. How have I seen the work of this church make an impact in the community around me? How have I seen a life changed? How have I seen a difference being made somewhere in our community? Write that down on that apple and put it, put it in the fruit, as we, in the bowl, as we create this, this tree of life together over the next few weeks. God is at work in the midst of this community. And by the grace of God, may we be changed as we give ourselves to God's mission. Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, thank you. Thank you for your life-giving love and grace. Thanks for the transforming power of your creative spirit among us. Help us to be the kind of church that you want us to be. Help us to be the kind of people that you want us to be as members of this community. We love you, Lord. We pray all of these things to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Amen.